In last week's video, I asked whether the Netherlands were the dark horses in this World Cup. And the answer is no, because it's Morocco. And we've seen a lot of teams base their campaigns on defensive solidity. Brazil, England, Portugal, the Netherlands themselves. But none have taken it as far as the Moroccans, who despite having much less quality, have gone further than all of them. So as the first African team to ever reach a semi-final of the World Cup, I just had to analyse the tactics that have gotten them this far, and why they're more than just good defensively. So let's do it. Before we start breaking down this Morocco team, I want to give another quick shout out to the video sponsor, OneFootball. The OneFootball app is your one-stop shop for all football news and the best place to follow the final days of the 2022 World Cup. It's all of the news, fixtures, scores and stats in one place. And you can even catch highlights, goals and original content from OneFootball all inside the app. Not only that, but you can follow your favourite club and international teams to get specific notifications about the stories that matter to you. There's always a big rush to sign players after a World Cup, and with the January transfer window on the horizon, the OneFootball app is the perfect place to stay up to date with all of the links, rumours and confirmations. So you can go and download the OneFootball app for free by clicking the first link in the description, and thanks again to OneFootball for sponsoring the video. So what has made this Morocco team competitive is their defensive system, and that's where I'll start. Structurally, it's a very clear 4-1-4-1, and the important characteristic is that it's extremely compact. Not only vertically, so the midfield and defence are very close together, but also laterally. This is a very narrow defensive system, and that means you'll very often see every player packed into a small section of the pitch. When discussing Morocco, this is the defining characteristic, not the fact that they defend deep. They can and do defend deep, but it's not their only mode, which I'll talk about a bit later. Anyway, it's not particularly insightful to say that Morocco are compact. Most defensive systems try to be compact. The unique thing about this side is the philosophy behind their defending, and the coach, Walid Regragi, is clearly in tune with the modern footballing landscape. We live in a world where football is understood largely in terms of space. It's what underpins the positional game we often talk about, where the pitch is divided into zones, and your players occupy those zones in a way that allows you to progress the ball into space efficiently. In fact, I made a video on Spain not too long ago, explaining how they use zone occupation and movement to create and exploit space. Well, Morocco have looked at this footballing landscape and based their entire ideology on controlling and denying the space that other teams value so much, which is expressed therefore in a zonal defensive system. You're not worrying too much about specific players, but the spaces those players want to move into. A great way to illustrate this is to show you the role of Sofyan Amrabat, the defensive midfielder in this 4-1-4-1, because his job is literally to patrol the central channel and stamp out any danger that arrives into it. You might have heard of coaches or analysts talking about zone 14, and it's just jargon really, but if you divide the pitch into the 6x3 grid, zone 14 is the central area outside the box. And although the research on it is a little bit outdated, it's still an area where a lot of chances are created. And Morocco have just dropped Amrabat in there and said, this is your territory and nobody comes in. And most of the time that means he's not marking anyone, but he's preempting the fact that here between the lines is where creative players want to be. I mean, how many times on this channel do we talk about getting between the lines to progress the ball? Morocco have a dedicated player to prevent that. And because you're not man marking, opposition players will be quote unquote free. It's just about moving to close down that space quickly and as a unit. So when the ball goes wide, the entire Moroccan team as one great block shifts across to compress the space. And the midfielders in particular have to be very athletic. You'll see them stepping up to close down a defender, but then curving their run back to block a pass into midfield. All the while, as the ball moves from side to side, Amrabat is doing shuttles from one side of the pitch to the other. That's why this team isn't always extremely deep. Against Belgium, for example, who built up with a double pivot, Morocco's two eights actually went and pressed them. They just trust themselves to cover ground quickly and return into shape. And you can see the back line is a bit higher here in order to stay compact. On top of all of this, but more difficult to analyze, are the excellent defensive fundamentals of this team. So the back line moves in complete synchronicity. Whenever there's a backwards pass, they squeeze up to regain territory, but then if a player has space to get their head up, they prepare to drop back. They're also great defenders in the box. It helps that they get a lot of bodies in there, but they do read crosses well, they're physical, they deal with it, and then they're very, very quick to regain shape when the ball leaves the box. This is Big Sam's dream. But defending like this, especially as games go on and the defensive line does drop, it means you have to be okay giving up possession. 
Against Spain, they had just 24% of the ball, and it was 27% against Portugal, and the territory disadvantage is even more dramatic. Their field tilt against Spain was 20%, and against Portugal, just 14%. Your opponent is in your final third often, and you're very rarely in theirs. And that's a gamble. But in both of these games, against opponents with higher quality, the gamble paid off, and not just in terms of the result. Because Morocco actually had the higher XG against Spain, and only a fraction less against Portugal. Which tells you straight away that this team is about much more than just defending. And you're about to find out why. Let's go back to that 4-1-4-1 shape, because it's the first indication that Morocco mean business. They're not just defaulting to a 5 at the back where everyone is behind the ball, they want to win it in areas that can very quickly become threatening. So in this example against Spain, the ball is played between the lines, and three players, obviously including Amrabat, close down the space. You can see already when the turnover happens, there are five Moroccan players ahead of the ball, and so just numerically, this already is extremely dangerous. Never mind the fact that they're attacking a boatload of space. This example where the ball is one in midfield with players ahead of the ball is very different to this. A five at the back system which is almost exclusively defending the last line, where winning the ball back doesn't immediately threaten your opponent. But it's not good enough just to talk about numbers. What makes the difference for Morocco is who is capitalising on these situations. And I want to specifically mention their wingers, Sofiane Bouffal and Hakim Ziyech. As the wide players on each side, they're very often the first progressive option, and they take on a lot of responsibility. In fact, most of Morocco's passing combinations happen on the flanks. These two are technically excellent players, and you can trust them in tight spaces to hold it up, to find difficult passes, and most importantly, to carry the ball and beat opponents. And I actually want to highlight this point, because carrying, or dribbling, is something that Morocco do really well. And you can't say that about too many teams in this tournament. But in a world of man-to-man -man pressing, having the capacity to beat a man is so disruptive and effective in getting from back to front. And it's not just the wingers. Azadine Unahi, the midfielder, is someone I've been very impressed by. He'll take responsibility, beat a man, and attack space. And so it's this technical quality and daring that make Morocco a genuine threat on those rare occasions where they do get the ball. In fact, their goal against Portugal wasn't even a counter-attack, it was a passing move starting from the goalkeeper. It's Unahi again who takes responsibility, beats a man and finds Ziyech, who switches it out to Bufal, a 1-2 with Unahi again who plays it out wide, and they score from the cross. And again, like on the defensive side, they just have good attacking fundamentals. Players miles away from the ball react quickly and break forward upon turnovers, and they aren't just tied to their shape. So here, Masrawi at left back carries the ball forward, but then goes on a very ambitious, but successful, underlapping run. The kind of run that heavily disrupts opponents. This, to me, a carry and run like this from your fullback, demonstrates a real freedom and spontaneity to Morocco's attacking. You can see from their pass maps throughout this competition, there's no real pattern or plan. You've just got good players making decisions in the moment, and trying to exploit the bountiful space that they're generally running into. And that brings me on to this final little bit, where I just want to touch on a subject that really interests me, and is really about the bigger picture of football and football tactics. Because I'd really characterise this Moroccan team as anti-meta, and I mean that in a couple of different ways. For one, this team is set up to directly counter the prevailing ideas in modern football, which in a nutshell is positional play. And that's all oriented around space. Spain were definitely the poster boys in this competition for those ideas, and Morocco set up to directly counteract them. But not only that, they're doing so using the exact opposite philosophy. While everyone is pressing high and man-to-man, -man, this is a compact zonal approach, and instead of an attacking system governed by rules and automations, more agency is given to the player on the ball. It's more spontaneous. So the fact that a team like Morocco was able to compete with, and even best those very modern teams, it's really interesting, and it makes you wonder, as most teams try to replicate the Pep Guardiola ultra-calculated positional football, will more teams like Morocco start to show up to counteract them? That for me is a hugely fascinating debate, and something I'd like to cover more in the future. But aside from all of that, regardless of whether Morocco get to the World Cup final or not, they've stuck a wrench into the modern footballing machine, they've embarrassed some big names, and they've entertained us all in the process. And for that, as a football fan, I'm pretty grateful. So thanks for watching everyone, let me know what you think of Morocco, could they do the impossible again by beating France and making it to the final? I love reading through your comments, there's some super insightful people watching these videos, 
so I'd love to hear what you think. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you back probably for a tactical preview before the final. So until then, take it easy.